in the world that has been created, there are rules and laws and regulations, and they, it goes everything according to, according to them. There are two that have free will and can do whatever they want. It is God on above and man below. They have free will. And because of having free will, God created the world. And then, in a way, he created man. And he says to man, that is the end of the, of the story of creation, he says, and now you become, you are the world that has been created. There are rules and laws and regulations. And they, it goes everything according to, according to them. There are two that have free will and can do whatever they want. It is God on above and man below. They have free will. And because of having free will, God created the world. And then, in a way, he created man. And he says to man, that is the end of the, of the story of creation. He says, and now, you become, you are my junior, junior partner. You can do, you can create heaven or earth or, or hell. You can create hell, but not, not in, in a, big, a big, such a big scale as I am doing it. But you, you can, but you are the one that can create. So now it is your duty to create. You, I did, up to now, I have done my thing. Now it is la sort. The world, God created the world in order for you, man, to do. We are basically driven to and in a way obliged to, to be progressive. Progress is something that we have to do because it is not just, we are never fighting against God when we, we are creative. We are fighting with him. Uh, very intelligent people who said, if God wanted us to, to, to fly, he would have created us with wings. No, he created us without wings, but they, with the ability to outfly any bird. So I found that um, a nice way to begin our program tonight. I'm not sure the right word. We'll figure it out. Our Zoom tonight, where we have a conversation about why we all are so passionate about Jewish music, why we invest so much time, energy, um, heart and emotion into producing it or performing it or singing it, and how we can um, continue to inspire ourselves and motivate ourselves to be better at what we do, entertaining the Yiddish Welt um, at their simchas. So first of all, I think that Jewish music is at its, its it's just beginning. Obviously, you know, we're, wait, we're all waiting for Mashiach, and whenever Mashiach comes, obviously that'll be the epitome. But we are definitely, we are definitely just getting started. I feel in my career, I'm getting, I'm just getting started. And the the entire when you talk about Jewish music, we have to kind of define what we're talking about. Like for me, the way that you have to understand, I was born in 1955, which is about 10 years after the Holocaust. So in 19 63, 64, I felt for the first time that the, 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 um, the first Pirche records, I don't know if anybody's aware of the first Pirche records, where, where um, um, let's go to the second Pirche record. That, that was the beginning of Jewish music for us, where we, I felt for the first time that Plali Yisrael was starting to sing again. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine. Obviously, between 1930 and 1946, um, there weren't, you know, Talishville wasn't, wasn't the singing move. And after 46, 47, 48, and, and then when, when, when Israel happened and with all the differences of opinion and so on, it took a while. And I felt that in 63, 64, Talishville came out of their shell and began to start singing. And the singing is getting more and more and more, more and more exciting as we move along. So also the question is, what's the tachos of it? We have your, your question kind of also, you mentioned about being Samayach people at Simchas. To me, that is really a secondary part of, of um, you're, you're, you're speaking more from, from a performance angle. I'm, I'm speaking also from, from a performance angle. angle. Am yeah. I correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm speaking, I'm actually addressing both, which is because I'm very okay. passionate about the whole gamut 
of um, the Jew in the Jewish performing arena. So um, I feel like musical skill and technique goes hand in hand with creativity because right. to be professional, right. you have to have the technique and you have to have the content. So the word, I'm looking, the word I'm looking for, as opposed to entertainment, is inspiration. So to me, the, the purpose of music and is inspiration. Even, even if it's at a, at a simcha, the objective of it is to inspire someone to get to be, to be higher, in a higher place than is. It's very interesting. I, I just, um, I learned the Gemara very recently about wine, that we use wine whenever we want to, Whenever we want to get to a higher place, we use wine to get to that level. That's why at a, in a chuppah, there's a mitzvah to drink wine or to, or at a bris or, you know. So to me, Jewish music is there to bring us to a higher level, either to be happier or, you know, that kind of thing. So the inspiration is, is just, it's bursting. Now, um, as you mentioned, as far as technology is concerned, yes, look, technology is one of the, you know, if Mashiach doesn't come at a certain point in time, what happens is, sorry that I keep on belaboring that point. You have to understand I come from a, uh, I come from a world where the exit strategy of Kali Israel was Mashiach. If you notice when my, my first hundred albums that I was involved, the first hundred that was always had, no Jew will be left behind, a letter to Mashiach, the time is now, goodbye Golis, we are ready. Uh, not, nobody, you know, forever won. So I, I'm, I keep coming back to that because that's really the exit strategy. We have, to remind people, we have to remind people that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Mashiach was a very loaded word. <laughs> Only Lubavitchers were using it. <laughs> that, well, the Lubavitchers were not afraid to use it. They were not afraid to use it. You know, and it, and it, it was a world, I guess, that the Rebbe, and I'm, I, came, I'm very, I came very late to this picture, is... is um, I always felt that the reason why he stressed it was because he saw this tremendous Hezchadas as Americans, Jews were becoming more successful and the Moisdes were getting bigger and the yeshivas were getting, so it kind of became an end in itself. And I believe that he felt that, okay, okay, I know we got great Moisdes, but don't forget that our exit strategy is not to be great American Jewish from people. Our exit strategy is that one of these days that the Tikkun should come already and we should get. So to me, I was very, I got the message that way from the beginning. So it was never controversial for me. Let's just answer the question. Overall, are you impressed with what you're seeing? I, there's a tremendous amount of great stuff and a tremendous amount of uh, mediocrity. Perfect. It's very easy for somebody who is mediocre to get into the same, to get, like for instance, if, if, if a person produced a mediocre album, they would never be able to find a distributor that would distribute it. So that was the end of it. So you had to be good. Today, it's very easy. And uh, let's discuss CDs for a minute. The CDs are five by five. It takes up the same room as, you know, as, uh, as if all, all CDs take up the same amount of room. So that kind of brought down the level where there was no more, you know, there were no more, like for instance, in, in, a, for, for a, in, the, in the secular world, for a person to get a recording contract, they have to be incredible when they finally get that recording. I think, I think what I think what you're you're expressing is that because the Jewish market is such a niche market, there's not real room for intense competition where you can disregard someone's album because it's not so great when you know that that person is a fellow yid who put their heart and soul into it, and it's you know by this kaidesh and like we're not we, you know we don't. We don't get there, which is has its pros and its cons. When we started out, how did you get an album? It was the record business at the time. How did you get a record into a store? You had to get a record distributor. And the record distributor would, would finance the album. So in order to get financing, you had to prove that you really had something great. Right. And this record company would then come to a store and would tell the the the, 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 the Swarm store or the Judaica store or the re whatever, wherever they were selling these albums and would tell them, look, trust me, I'm telling you, you put this on your shelves, you're going to make money. Yeah. That's, that's gone today. Today, everybody who produces, all they got to do is they got to come up with that five by five jewel case yes. and they can occupy a, sp a space on the shelf. Yes, it, but that's what I'm saying. Space on the shelf. Yes, but that's what I'm saying. Because of that's that, there's no real discretion. And that's yeah. why I invited, made this Zoom invitation only because I felt like 
I was inviting the, the, the musical community or the people in the musical community that I feel um, do put their best foot forward and do really produce some creative, amazing stuff. And you're speaking today to an audience of a lot, a lot of great creative minds. I wanna get into the next question because we have a lot to cover. All right, um, so what you just watched were two separate messages. The first message that music needs, the first message is that music needs to come bursting out of you and that if it's not bursting out of you, don't do it. So one might argue that makes perfect sense. You should be able to just spill your creativity out into the world and if you can't, it's not for you. On the other hand, that's not necessarily true because some of the greatest creative minds in modern history um, struggled with writer's block, with lack of inspiration, with you know, projects that weren't weren't coming through. For, you know, just all the elements that songwriters and creatives struggle with. So my question um, is as follows, and this is actually posed from Jeslia. Jeslia was going to join us tonight. She's here in Israel. She woke up early, but they have no lights. There's a snowstorm here. I don't know, my sis. But I'm going to pose the question on her behalf. Jezbia lives here in Israel. She was born in Mexico. She's a convert of 10 years. She grew up singing in a church where her father was the pastor and they were missionaries that had a band that used to play gospel music. She became a convert, moved to Israel and her and her husband are pursuing their music careers now in Jewish music. Jezbia also sang on my last three videos. She was one of the vocalists. Um, so she asked this question. She said that there seems to be a leniency in Jewish music of borrowing secular ideas, whether it be musically, lyrically, stylistically, and so on. Um, there are arguments that it's better for Jewish kids to listen to, you know, secular music channeled through Jewish singers, which is fair. But there's also what Jesli is asking. Um, is there a desensitized? Is there ha, have we been des, have we been desensitized, um, or has you know borrowing from other cultures musically? I'm saying, and you know through the arts, always been something that you didn't have done. In other words, art reflects the time. So is it a bad thing that we tend to draw secular music into Jewish music, or is that the norm? Should we try higher? Do you understand my question? Yes, but, but, but you have to define when you talk about secular music, are you talking about secular, actual secular music or technology used in secular music or that kind of, is that what you're referring to? Or are you referring to actual? I'm referring to, I'm referring, uh, Jezia was referring to singers who will take a track that's from a Disney movie written by, you know, a Gentile about, you know, a topic that has nothing to do with Yiddishkeit and then re-singing it um, sometimes with the same musical track, but you know, rerouting the message to Hashem. Even though, as Jezlia feels, some of these songs were written about La Havdala of Abdalais, you know, people that they used to sing about in her church. So she feels like, you know, we have to be very, very careful. And sometimes she hears singers from singers singing covers that Christian um, record labels are 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 putting out. And, and so she wanted me to ask you this question. How do you feel about that? Okay, so again, first of all, I, I didn't preface this. I should have prefaced this. Whatever I, whatever I respond, it's my own opinion. I respect everybody else's opinion. And please understand that. My opinion is not, is, you know, that's just my opinion. It comes from my years of my experiences and so on and so forth. Um, I think your question really boils down to what is the definition of the Jewish song? And I think, I think that's what I'm really hearing. The people are always asking um, a non-Jewish song, a Jewish song, a Hasidic song. A, uh, so my opinion always is that, a, that a, a Jewish song is a song written by a Jew. There's no such a thing as a, a God prefers specific chord progressions. He doesn't like when you go from an F to a uh, to, to a to a G minor seventh in the C major scale, he doesn't like that. It, nonsense. I, that, that I also don't buy into the fact that there are certain rhythms. In other words, which is what, what is rhythm? It's, it's breaking up a bar into into a certain 
uh, number of accents, that there are certain accents that are not kosher and certain others are. So then what the, the defining factor is, who's the writer? Where's it coming from? Where's it originating? If it's a Jewish, a Jewish, it's a Yid, it's a Yiddish song. If it's a guy, it's a guy song. If it's a Hasid, Hasid it's a, Hasid, it's a Hasid song. I always tell people that if the guy would have written Anavim Anavim, Anavim Anavim would have been a guy song. The, the, the mazel that I had is that Baruch Hashem that I got to write that. So, the, so it's, an, and I'm Jewish, so it's a Jewish song. So that's, that's, that's number one. Number two, as far as, as far as bringing, so what now, once you have the source, the makar, the one that brought the song into the world, either has a neshama or doesn't. So obviously we're pulling from a, and I'm sorry that I'm uh, sounding, you know, a little chauvinist, Jewish, Jewishly chauvinistic, but we pull from a higher source than, than somebody who is very, very talented and pulls from a source which is lower. It's very hard to, to, to take a song which comes from a lower source and inspire yourself to get to a level that you can. And, you know, that's not, that's no excuse for, for mediocre music. I mean, uh, then on the other hand, you have the greatest uh, composers in the history of the world, whether it's Rogers and Hammerstein or Kander and Ebb or Lerner and Lowe or, or, or um, Irving, Irving Berlin, or these are all, these are all Eden, you know? They may have not, you know, they, 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 they sadly, there weren't, there weren't enough Chabad houses around in those days, so they didn't get a chance to, to, uh, to do some, you know, to get, to get a little closer and to see what it feels like to, to put on film and so on and so forth, but they were Eden. So even them, they are drawing from a, from a, from a, from a higher source. It's very interesting. When I was a little child, I come from a Sapmer home, and uh, I'll tell you, frankly, my mother, Leah Shulam, was a very sophisticated lady. And she made sure that I knew every single Rogers and Hammerstein, Rogers and Hart, Lerner and Lowe, Kander and Ed, that I knew every one of their songs. It's fascinating. We talk about Vidal and Sattva. And my mother said, you know, these are Yidin and they write damn great music. I want you to hear it. And it, it definitely affected me. So now, as far as gospel music is concerned, the gospel music is, it, I think you you mentioned that it's very it's very inspirational in that point. It's uh, it's incredible to to see it and so on. As far as a person singing gospel songs, trying to inspire Eden, I'm not sure that it works. Uh, you know, I have a song called Be'eras Tichli that I wrote for for uh, for Oha. That was the first song I wrote to him. I, I'm not sure it's a very inspiring song. It's a fun song. But I'm not sure it's it's uh, it inspires you. So there there is no one right answer. I think that the artist who the artist knows the place that the song is coming from, and if it's coming from a place that is truly um, um, you know inspired by good things, then it has the capacity to inspire other people to do and feel good things. Um, as far as stylistically, I mean, that, 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 that we could do a whole Zoom about what exactly the definition of Jewish music is. We have the Mizrahi influence. We have the Eastern European influence. We have, you know, hip hop influence. Like Jewish music is so eclectic. Like you could listen to an album and you could feel like you're in Hawaii and then Russia and then Moscow, the whole, you know, and then, you know, dancing, um, in a club. <laughs> I would like to add one more. I would like to add one more thing to what you're saying, and that is that um, you know, in the beginning when we started our career, when we were when when, when we were young. When I say we were young, I mean myself and the other people around me. Uh, Baruch Shait was older than me, but Ab Rottenberg and, and, and you know, Rachel Begun, and we were we were all about the same age, and we started. And I remember that the ideal thing was, yeah, but can you write a Geisha song? That was like, yeah, you can write. Uh, you know, Dear Nikolai, you can write uh, No Jew Will Be Left Behind, but can you write a Goyish song? And at that time, we were very excited about it. That was the epitome. But I can tell you that as we moved along in life and we realized that the purpose of a song is to inspire, to inspire another Yid, all of those, all of those, all that stuff, you know, it, it, it left, it went. You know, so... Um, I hear you, and I think that's um, a great way to channel into the next subject. Um, 
I hope everyone's enjoying. I certainly am. Uh, each question brings me into 50 different questions because I literally could talk about music 24 hours a day, but I'm just trying to, you know, this is the first time we're doing something like this. I'm just trying to streamline, um, you know, the messaging here so that we have a productive evening and that people get an opportunity to ask you a question as well. Um, what I want to talk about, because I, I write songs professionally, um, I work in music professionally, I have to meet musical deadlines, um, people hire me to complete projects that they give me money for, so, you know, there's no room for me to wait until I'm inspired or to have writer's block or to self-doubt, like when you accept the deposit, okay, to write 10 songs for a school play, you have to come up with those songs. And if you're, you know, if you have self-worth, you want them to be great songs. So that could be a very challenging place for artists. And um, you are somebody who is a professional songwriter, a professional arranger, a professional composer, and a million other professional things. So what, what is it that separates the successful musical people from the not so successful musical people? And what is it that separates the successful songs from the not so successful songs? In other words, what is your, what is your definition of a performer that's doing a fantastic job in the Jewish musical industry or in the Jewish musical arena? And what is your definition? You could do this you know, in two parts of a song that is really successful at what it you know, set out to do. So tell us a little bit about that based on your experience in, in professional songwriting. You started off in one place and you landed in a totally different place. It's fine, it doesn't matter. I, um, I think that both of these final questions that you asked are related to each other. And again, my opinion, I see there's some great performers over here. I see, uh, I, and, and uh, of course you may have different experiences. So I see there's a bracha Jaffe here that I, that I hear so much from my daughter about and so on. So in my opinion, what makes, what makes a star a star, what makes a, a successful performance is something called honesty. What that means is, it's, it's uh, you know, there was a, there's a fascinating story in the Gemara that um, Rabbi Gamliel was the president of, he was the Nazi of Kali Yisrael and he was very, specific about who he would allow into the into the uh, into the yeshiva to learn he had a uh, his his entrance the bar was that uh, some somebody was he had to be inside the same as outside he had a, no 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 two-face you couldn't be different and he had a very small yeshiva and it says over there that one day that there was a very famous um, quarrel and Rabbi Gamliel was deposed and Rabbi Elizabeth Azaria became became the Rosh Hashiva, and it said that that day, 400 um, students were admitted. And the Rav Gamliel felt bad about it, but the point is that there's something about being true. There is nothing as inspiring to an audience as to watch an, a, a person who is entertaining, who's really, he's not trying to pull something on the audience. The audience is incredibly sensitive to this. They know it without knowing how they know it. They just say, ah, I don't know, that person wasn't, uh, I don't know, something about that person. What bothers the person, it's not the voice. It's not even so much the tune. It's the real, it's the real, uh, you know, unity of the, of the, of the panemius of the person and the chesonius and the outside of the person. So to me, first of all, a true, a true um, star, a true uh, performer is somebody who can take what's inside, completely focus and bring it out and the audience will believe it. And to the point that they won't be able to breathe, no matter how good of a voice there is or there is, that's number one. A song on the other hand is to me this similar, a Jewish song as far as I'm concerned, which we haven't discussed yet, is something that's triggered by a text. In other words, so for, for me anyway, you know, when I was very young, I used to sit down at the piano and uh, imagine, I mean, the first one I wrote, I remember, was Kol Bar Baram HaNishma at the time. Um, you, may, you may know it, you know, Kol Baram HaNishma, that was my first song. And so that was written as, as, a, as like a pattern. 
So there the melody was just patterns. So there was these beautiful patterns. And then we found the word Yigal Salak at the time, who was my mentor. He found the words Kolba Rama Nishman and we put it and he added it to it and it was wonderful. That was the last time that I wrote a song where the melody came first and then the lyrics. From that point on, it's always a text. So to me, what's inspiring, what brings me into the into the into this whatever you want to call this place of inspiration, is it in a special text? Whether it's a, it's an English text or there is a very powerful message, and I believe that the message, in order to have wings, needs to have a great melody with it. So if the text and the, the if the melody really interprets the text, that's called a successful song. So if a if if the the artist really is honest and brings his panemius out in, into the into the outer world and there's a there's a unity that's a successful artist and if the song does the same to the lyric that's a successful song there's a certain symbiotic relationship and and we are kind of without knowing exactly what it is about that artist i i know that the person is honest and i know and and I, I'm, I'm, I agree, I'm asking him, I agree, I will let myself be inspired by that person. If the person is not doing that, stay away, stay away from me. Don't, don't you dare, don't you try to get me emotional because you're not being honest. And I believe that the Jewish neshama is the most incredible truth detective that exists. They know right away, that's that person is, yeah, there's something there. And it's not about a voice, it's about, I love that. First of all, I just want to say that if you were to create a masterclass, I would buy your masterclass. I'm just saying. So <laughs> as I'm watching you, I'm like, please, something to think about. Um, I Thank love you. that Thank answer. You. I love that answer. I totally agree. Um, I actually tell people very often that um, I'm not a trained singer. I struggle singing. It's out of all my skills um, or my talents, singing is, you know, it's, I, I use my voice to sing my songs, let's put it that way. Um, but I've always been authentic with my audiences. I've always like communicated freely and ex you know expressed appreciation to them for hearing my songs and you know obviously learned over the years how to entertain properly, which is something that I specifically teach about in my masterclass. Um, but yes, authenticity is key. And as far as songwriting goes, so you're saying that the message, it's all about the message. Right. You have so, and that is true because when I'm hired to write songs, I always ask a series of questions. Who is the song for? What is the audience? Why are you writing the song? Um, you know, tell me everything about this topic that you feel is important to relay in a song. And then I can construct the song that reflects what the client is looking for or what how they want to feel. That's the idea, in my opinion. So that was fantastic. We are going to watch two more video clips. Now, um, one is two minutes, and then at the end is another minute. And then we'll ask questions and open it up to everyone who's watching. So I owe you, I owe you one more comment uh, before you start the next. Just a little, a little uh, an anecdote. Yes. The first time Avram, Avram Fried came to my house, he came with a guy called Shia Mendelowitz. Um, his name was Avram Shapsi Akoyin Friedman at the time when he walked into this house this piano and we sat down and and um he said to me I, w I want songs i said what do you mean you want songs tell me tell me a little bit about yourself why do you want to sing you know it's funny i was i was younger but i i figured how am i going to get into this to this new person that i just met they knocked on the door and they opened the door and they sat down next to me so he says to me he says i am a lubavitch of Hasid. And by us, we believe that no Jew gets left behind. And I want a song that will reflect this idea. And I can tell you that I sat, I turned around to the piano, I put my hands on, on and the words came, no Jew will be left behind. Where in the, he basically, he hit me so hard with that. I looked at him, he had fire in his eyes. He says, I'm, a, I'm the youngest of a, a big family who they're all shlichim. And I'm, 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 I'm one of the youngest and I'm uh, not there yet, but that's what I want to do in my life. And I had not known, I didn't know, I, I didn't know at that time what Chabad was. I knew Chabad was the Hasidus. 
about that. I had no idea about about the read the reach out about that whole. That was you know, he's the one that introduced me at the beginning to this idea, but that that was an, an example where the the singer, the message, the text, the idea, everything happened in one shot. And from that point on, we uh, you know. We did good, that, good that night, by the way, he was nervous that what happens if his if his uh, career doesn't um, take off. <laughs> we decided to change his name to Freed just in case. Well, I I, I would listen to Avram Freed if his name was Avram Freed or Berkovovich, whatever. <laughs> He's that great in my opinion. Um, um, that was a nice story. Thanks for sharing. Uh, right. I I totally agree. I think that songwriting, you have to be um, bold enough to sometimes just say the message out loud, <laughs> mm -hmm. just, you know, Absolutely. put it out there. And, and, and every song that, you know, a, a songwriter writes, they put a part of themselves into, whether it's a song for a preschool graduation or a song for a wedding or a song for a record, you know, you always put your heart into it. And that's what makes a successful song. What do you feel about musicians who tell you they need to get high? They need to drink at a simcha in order to let loose on stage. They need to get into the zone. Now, it, it, it's a funny way to jump into it, but basically what I'm saying is we all need inspiration. We all need to do a great job, right? So sometimes people turn to alcohol and drugs and they it's an excuse maybe for other things. Maybe they feel they weren't so successful and they have self-doubt or whatever the case is. But when it comes to being a professional musician, what role do these things play, and do you feel like there's an issue with it? So you're asking whether, whether in my opinion, uh, whether people use uh, substances in order to get themselves into a uh, into a place where they're more comfortable with themselves and so on. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, there's two types. The of fact, it's the fact of life. It's out, it's it's there. I mean, uh, you have to be a very very good very very good performer somebody who's incredibly comfortable and um not afraid which means somebody's not afraid to fail also by the way that that would always would never ever have uh, had a glass of wine before going on stage or so on i i, I know that it impairs There's no question about it that it impairs and um we're not discussing the right or wrong of it but uh, i know that it's being used by people. They do that sometimes when they're not ready for the performance and for whatever reason, and they'll, they'll have a glass of wine before. Is it, it does impair you though. It's much, much better if you can get to, to the stage prepared and ready for, for the, that you don't need to do something like that. But people do that. There's no, uh, you know. What about, what about in you're talking to a person, you're talking to somebody who never had a glass of wine before I was 51 years old. Never, not even once. So that's why I'm asking you this Price question. grape juice. So that's I why I'm know. asking you this question specifically because you are the consummate professional. You don't rely on outside sources of, you don't you don't need narcotics to get you into a headspace where you write a song that can you know blow someone away. But right. because so many musicians and songwriters in our community don't necessarily have the musical. Uh, mind that you have they don't necessarily never learned how to write music they you know they're not tremendously skilled very often they become the type of musician like the Kurt Cobain's and the um, Amy Winehouse's who just bring their oozing talent to the stage but there's obviously an issue of dependency and like you say an issue where they're not going to perform the way they should because they're impaired so I it's just it's just a topic I wanted to bring up because I feel like um it exists and nobody ever wants to talk about it. Well, <laughs> look, Amy Waynehouse or a, um, well, Kurt Cobain, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with, but Amy Waynehouse to me was, was like one, one of the, you know, I have the, I got a lot nothing to talk about in, in, in writing and everything. And I once read that one of the reasons why, why those kind of people are use these substances is because when they are on stage, they are in such an incredible lofty space. And then when the lights go down, this was the, this was the very interesting um, I think that I noticed with, with uh, La Havdu, with, with the greats that, that you know, the, the Mordechai Ben Davids, the, the Avram Frieds, the, uh, that what happens is there's, there's a kind of a reality that happens on stage when, when you have a light shining on you and 
all you can see is the top part of, of, of thousands of heads. And um, so you, you have to rise above that to begin with. And if you manage to rise above that and you realize that all of those eyes are focused on you, it brings you to a certain, to a certain level of being, whatever that is. And if you're not prepared for that, then eventually the lights go out, go out. Every movie comes to the end and then you have to go up that hill to get out of the, to get out of the theater or, or whatever, you know? It, what they, the, in order for them, they want to continue that feeling. In order to continue that feeling, they will do that substance that you're talking about and because they, they cannot deal with the, the, the uh, what do you call it? The, um, the climax. You know, the, between the two, between a minute ago, I was king of the world, and now I'm looking for my car in the parking lot. So, so uh, a, a Yiddish kind, I believe, has enough strength and enough um, resources to understand what it is that you're trying to do when you go out on stage. And therefore, when the lights go down, where are you going back to? You're going back to family, you're going back to life, you're going back to Toyota, to, to you're going back to Daven, you're going back, you know, that's. You know, you're not going back to whatever somebody who is not in that world goes back to. It. So, right, there's an element you know, of you know we don't need that kind of thing. You know, there's an element of self worship in the secular world where the rush disappears when the audience is gone because they love the feeling of I'm your hero, I'm your god, I'm, I'm on stage. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, it's 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 horrific to be a superstar, and then you know, like to be a geisha superstar, and then the lights go down and say, oh, so what? So what now? You know, it, it, there's, there's nothing. You can't, you can't even do anything. What are you going to do? What, what, what inspiring thing are you going to do with that incredible feeling that you have after the stage? Imagine you go, you, you open up, a, you open up a, a, a tillum or you go visit somebody who needs, who needs in, inspire. Imagine what kind, of a, what kind of inspiration you can do after you've done a two-hour concert for somebody. If you take that and you, you, you bring it into... into into our world, into a Yiddishkeit, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I wonder what happens to these people. They have to drink, they have to do, you know, because the balance, the, the between the dichotomy between these two worlds is staggering. Right, because when, when you have, and I say this again in my master class, when you perform on stage, it's a very, it's a, it's a really spiritual experience. And you, the, the high that you take with you could be, not could be, it comes from a holy place and you channel it into your life and then the the, the music becomes a bracha in your life and for me music Absolutely. has always been a bracha oh oh it really does <laughs> yeah, really. It a lot of bracha in my life hi rabbi ruby how are you shalom how are you hi ah, ruby how are you all the way from australia um i think some of the things that we covered tonight um i just want to recap before we continue with questions, um, is that we we know that Hashem and man are partners in creativity and creation, and that creating music and performing music is a holy um, aspiration and a you know a calling, and that when we do it with authenticity and when we speak our truth and when our messaging is on point, then we create good Jewish music that can inspire others. We don't need to rely on alcohol or drugs. Um, and that um, you wrote some incredible songs. I, I, I want to just talk about some more songs that you wrote because when you were like, "No Jew left behind," did you like? I, I I looked you up on Wikipedia. It's like you wrote like 800 Jewish songs. Like who could even keep track? Like you know, all I know is that you didn't write any of my songs, but you pretty much wrote everything else. Um, so now you have my email address if you're interested. <laughs> yes, and I'm going to continue to correspond with you by email. I, I so appreciated your enthusiasm for this conversation when I first reached out to you, and I thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, I want to just say that I am very impressed in general by the camaraderie, camaraderie in the Jewish music community, um, and I do feel like it's important that those of us who have the experience and the skill and the know-how and the knowledge, and, like you do, share that with the coming generation because we always try to learn from people who have experience and people that we look up to and people that have succeeded in doing what we're trying to do. And the fact that you're willing to share with us some of the secrets of um, the trade 
or behind the scenes of the trade is very inspiring. So I want to just ask you if you could share a few words to everyone watching and to the greater community, because I will be posting some of this on social media. What is your inspire us? Tell us a little bit or a lot of it, how we can be better writers, how we could be better performers, how we could connect more, how we could write better hooks, how we could, you know, communicate with our audience a little better. Don't give away everything because I'm trying to sell a masterclass, but inspire us a little bit. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much. You're very kind. Every, uh, your, your, all your, your warm words are very appreciated. And um, you have to know that, that first and foremost, um, you know, um, this may be a strange concept for you, the word shlichus, where you guys come from, but to me, writing music for Kuala is a shlichus. I'm a Lubavitcher, what are you saying? <laughs> I'm just. I'm, I'm what? I'm being, I'm being, I'm being. I'm a Lubavitcher, with... look, I have the Rebbe's picture behind um, you. I, I'm just kidding, I'm, please. <laughs> so it is a shlichus, and um, I always, felt as, as I got older that, you know, Kuala Israel needs music. Kuala Israel needs songs. They need new songs. They need new mimkayukos. They need new, they don't want to dance to the same song all the time. You know, there are all these reactionaries who say, what are you talking about? We had all these, um, you know, die, die, da, 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 da. what do we need to cast in a song? It's not true. We do need, we need to cast in the songs. We don't get inspired if the Lechadoides don't change. And some of the young people definitely don't get inspired. So, so Kuala will need songs, and therefore somebody has to write these songs, you know, and, and um, I am grateful for the Rebbein Shlodim that, that I've been given the opportunity to have people come to, to, to ask me to write songs for them. By the way, the one area of the, you asked about inspiration that I wanted to, because uh, you touched on this in the beginning, but we never, we never developed it, is that the greatest inspiration for writing a song, once you have the text, of course, is the order. Somebody says, I need an album. I gotta get it, I gotta get it done in a week. I once read a, uh, you know, Richard Rogers was a Yid who um, wrote one of the greatest, you know, he wrote most of the American songbook and he was buried, I read his, his he was buried in the pine he, and he had his, in his will that he wants to be buried in a, in a simple pine casket, you know? Anyway, he said that the most inspiring and everybody's always looking whatever I was walking in the woods and I saw the sunset and these gorgeous birds and there was a, the sun was shining or, or it's not that what it is is an order he says the, the most inspiring thing for me was that a certain composer dropped out of a project and they came to me and they said we have the theater ready we have to start in two months that's including everything including uh, rehearsal and 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 we need the songs he said, there's nothing as inspiring as that. And I, I got to tell you, humbly, I agree with him. There's nothing more inspiring than somebody coming and saying, I need a song, I need it now. You know, I remember when um, Mordechai and David, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, reference a song called Oid Yeshu. I don't know if you, if you know, you know, Oid Yeshu, is a Kate, right? So, so, so Mordechai and David at the time, he lives, he's, he lives a couple of houses down from me, he came over to the house on the Mount Shabbos, and he says that he got a job to do a very expensive dinner in Yerushalayim. In, in Geula, there was an old uh, um, army base and they no, no longer needed the army base. So they were gonna convert the army base into an old age home. And they said to him, they'll give him the job, but he has to bring a song that somehow relates to the evening. And he said to me, Yossi, I'm coming over and I'm, coming, I'm going home with a song. I have to leave to Israel tomorrow. And, and, and Baruch Hashem, you know, and he came over and we opened up, we had a tremendous Seat uh, uh, I remember there was a uh, Zechariah, I opened it up and there were these magical words. It's, it's hard to believe, but I can tell you that I still took many days wonder what that Zechariah Navi was doing on my, on my piano. I definitely was- I have, I, have a song, I have a song on that, on that uh, Sukkim, The City Streets Will Fill. On which, on Oyeju? Um, I sing, Yes, so I wrote that's a song the, called that's the, the Fill, and it's one of my most popular songs. Because the okay, so we could, because the, 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 emotion, uh, the, emotion. the, the picture of it, the, yeah. the emotion is... What do you fabulous. mean? During, during Corona, during the first lockdown, I, it was, it was Sphira, it was Sphira, it was, yeah, it was a three weeks. I did an acapella okay. video of it, and I filmed it in a country that was completely shut down. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking to myself, 
I had the chills because to describe children running in the streets, it suddenly felt so like this is how the times will be. There's no one in the streets, and now there will be people. It was it was really mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that was a a uh, where where the order was the inspiration. So th that pressure of needing to get it done now. That is incredibly inspiring. So, uh, you think you know, the fact that a song needs the, to exist. You touched on that in the beginning as to what that, it, that, that it's really that pressure that does it for me. Anyway, so having said what I said to you before, it's it's wonderful because I, as I move along, there are always there are new singers that are coming on, on, onto the uh, onto the market, so to speak, and some of them get it and some of them don't, and it's amazing. Those that get it understand that it's there to inspire, it's there to give wings to a text, and and they get it done, you know? The voice, if the voice is there, the voice is, you don't know what it is about that person, but there's something he's, he sings, or I guess in your world, she sings, and it just, it, you know, we get touched. So, um, and I see this happening, and I, and I see that Baruch Hashem, the, the message that the text drives the Jewish song is clear. It's clear in Klal Yisrael now, Baruch Hashem, that, that people are looking for that, that lyric that has not been discovered yet. They're looking for that message. They, you know, so it's starting from the right place now. So you're saying the best is yet to come. The best is definitely yet to come. We're just getting started. You know, people ask you how many songs you said before, 800, 900, whatever. The amount of songs, that, how many songs I wrote, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm interested in discussing the songs that I did not write yet, not the songs that I wrote. The songs that I wrote, they're, they're there. They're in the back. They're, yeah, yeah. fully producing royalties but uh, you know but it's the songs that we didn't write yet I can tell you that right now I'm in the middle of 60 songs 60 songs there is, I'm doing an album with Avremo with, with, with five new texts that uh, I never believed um, I don't know if you saw by Yoisha is one of the songs which was in the um, during, during the, the lockdown during Corona at Pesach we put that out last Pesach and so that we we revitalized our relationship. We began again, and Beli uh, Ainar Baruch Hashem. It's it's uh, that we have another Yiddish Nachas coming on the way. I'm working on the tenth note. So there are so many songs Beli Ainar that are in the works, and it's exciting. And I'm sure you I'm sure you're doing that as well. Amazing, amazing. I'm Israel so needs songs. They need music. I agree a hundred percent, and that's why I never <laughs> hesitate to write them, and I never hesitate to share them. I actually just put out three uh, covers of, Jew of um, Jewish songs that I've been singing for many years. And Baruch Hashem, they were greeted with open arms. So yes, I- Actually, I want to give you a compliment and uh, I would love, love him to hear that one of the things also that moved me was your masterclass. You know, we, we get all these, you know, through Facebook, you get all these masterclasses and you see more and more people are doing masterclasses. And by the way, they're great gifts. It's it's interesting. I have I, my partner is a big uh, forgot that comedian's name, Steve Martin fan, whatever. I don't I don't get yeah, Steve. He has a masterclass. Yeah and yeah. So so his son brought him bought him a present, a birthday present, a masterclass. And I said, what are you talking? What do you mean he bought you a present? He says, I don't know. I have I was able. Did you enjoy it? He says the best the best the best entertainment that I had in years. So it's a great idea to buy a masterclass. And here one day I see that you, you created the masterclass. And I looked at your masterclass and exactly the way it's laid out and it's organized and it's designed. And I said, hey, if she delivers 50% of what she says she's going to deliver in that masterclass, it's worth every penny. So that was one of the reasons I said, you know, I want to support somebody who is furthering Jewish music. That's, that's right now, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking to become a star. I'm not looking to get recorded, to get recognition. Baruch Hashem, I have the recognition, so on. I, I want to see Jewish music flourish. I want to see, there's not much that Eden can do as entertainment, real kosher entertainment. And the bunch of them gave us this, it's our gift. You know, the Baisamikdash was full of it. The, the, uh, all, of, all, of, all, of, all of these services that, that, we, that, that used to be were always full of music. The music is ours, it belongs to us, you know? The Russian gave that to us as a gift, and, and I want to see it grow. I want to see young kids taking piano lessons and learning how to be on stage and developing the confidence. I think it's great for everything. I think they, they become bigger Tommy Chachamim as well. It's not a, uh, a stira in my, never was by me, and it's not by the, the, the great people that I know.
So amazing, amazing. Okay, we're gonna ask a few people and ask questions. We'll wrap it up. I would say within the next fifteen minutes, we'll give everyone a minute to ask the question and then a minute or so a few minutes to answer. Hopefully, we'll get to a few. Um, I know Libby wanted to ask a question, so Libby, I'm going to unmute you. Oh, Libby. Okay. Oh, you hear me? Yes, sure. Okay. First of all, I just want to say I really like a lot of the stuff that you said, but since we're short in time, I was going to do some comments, but I won't. So <laughs> what I want What? Okay. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> okay. So what I do want to ask was as follows. As a as a as a cinematographer, filmmaker, um, you know, songwriter, I'm a songwriter as well. Um, I know that in order to really evoke the right message or emotion, whatever it is you want to convey to, to the viewer or the listener, you have to be in a certain place, obviously. Now, sometimes you're not in that place. Like if it's your own thing, you'll feel it anyway. You're there. But when you're, you know, like you, you spoke about meeting a deadline, um, Hanala, you know, this refers back to your second video where it's like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But you have to. How do you, so I understand my process of how I will get myself to a place. I have no choice. I have to get connected to the project. I have to get connected to what's happening at that moment because I need to create the product that I need to create, you know, the, the valuable product that they're expecting of me. I'm really curious to understand your process. How do you get yourself to that place if you're not in that place and you really must, you're either performing or you, you have to work on something right then and there. and produce something obviously that's going to have to have emotion and whatever whatever it is you need to produce okay so so the answer again always only my opinion so i want i want you i want to i want to be clear you know it's just i only have you know i'm always telling people i only have my opinion opinions is, opinions are something that are very related to the person who has them you know that right so all i can give you is my opinion so the difference between a professional and an amateur is the point that you just made right now. A professional is somebody who can get beyond that hang up or whatever that is because he has or she has a deadline and will get it done. That's what makes him, that, that's what makes a person professional. Lahavdul, Lahavdul, a surgeon comes into in the morning to and he has to do a he has to do a very very uh, serious surgery. But he's not there. Person, person is laying over there, desperate for the surgery, and he had an argument that last night with his kid or with his with his spouse or whatever, and uh, he's not in the mood. What what makes a great surgeon is whatever is I'm not in the mood, whatever is bothering me, that's on the side for now. I have to do what I'm doing right now. So that as you become more and more of a pro, which I'm sure you will be, because I saw some of your work, so you will you'll learn how to put that stuff aside. You just you know you, you do it. You, you you do what you have to do. There's no such a thing. You're I, very, very emotional about it. You're emotional about your writing. You're emotional. So you're like saying, you keep looking for that, that sweet spot. Believe me, you can, you can get it. You can get that spot if you need that song. Otherwise, somebody else is going to do that film. Otherwise, yeah. he's going to get Mordechai Ben David an ODA issue. And then I'm going to be sitting all my life and looking at this person in Zachary and saying, wow. If only I wouldn't, I would have been uh, in the right mood that night. You, know, you understand? So I do feel that I, I understand how to get to that place, Bar Hashem. You know, but I'm thinking I, I was wondering because a person of your scale and your level, where you've written so many hundreds and probably thousands of songs. So I was just wondering to, to hear what you had to say about it. Look, there's tremendous <laughs> Siata de Shmai. You have to you have to know that. There's, Clearly, I, I I'll, I'll give you another very little anecdote, another interesting anecdote. There was, um, there are times when I'll sit down to, to try to get that job done, and it'll be hours. I'll sit there for two, three hours, and then nothing. You, 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 know, you keep, you attack the piano from a million different angles, and you've been everywhere. You've tried every entrance. You, you know, like a chest. There's all these different openings. You've tried every opening, and it doesn't. And and and. You begin to feel, you know, and you have somebody sitting next to you who usually comes because they want to go home with something. And then I see already that it's getting to that point where it's not going to happen tonight, you know, and I take one leg and I put it over the piano seat and I'm like ready. And I still, I'm still with my right hand. I'm still on the piano. And suddenly, as I'm, I gave up already, suddenly there's a phrase. Uh, uh, and I say, what was that? And, and I quickly put my left leg back on, onto the piano and most of the time from that phrase when I had already given up, you know, 
it's called in the Hasidus, they call it bitl hayesh, where you, you get out of the way, kind of, and, and uh, the one son can write millions of songs. So, and not to be, it's funny, I have, a, I have a doctor, and what made this clear to me is I have a chiropractor who's a, he's a reformed Jew, a special guy, very, very spiritual, and he's a very good chiropractor. His name is, uh, you can tell his name is Dr. Jamie Forster. He's a, a great guy. Anyway, so I remember once I walked out with him, and I, I, I had a session, and he walks me out uh, to, the, to the waiting room, and I see, sitting in the waiting room, literally 25, 30 Hasid Shahid. And I, it was a Friday, and I took both of his hands and I said, these hands, you can heal all these people. I was, so he withdrew his hand as if he touched something hot. And he says, no, no, don't say that, don't say that. No, I can't, if I, if I think that way, he says, then I cannot do anything. You have to make, you have to let him, God can heal anybody, you just gotta let him through. You gotta let him, you know? And I realized that that night, that, that those three hours that I spent on the piano and not work, what finally happened is I let, I let him through. So once I let him through, you, you, you can't imagine what God can do, by the way. <laughs> we can't imagine the amount of songs he can write, the amount of videos, the amount of stories he can tell in video. You just gotta, they say, you know? Let him pass. So it's that, amazing. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's amazing that you're that you told this story because this is literally how I do it. P part of the way how I do it. If I'm, for instance, on a video shoot and I, whatever, I'm not in the right mindset, I'll I'll make that. I'll do that prayer, Tarjan. Because it's like just just let me connect. Just me, and it works. <laughs> I yeah. connect and I get I get the job done, Baruch Hashem. So it's interesting what you said. Thank you. Okay, thank you for letting me sneak into the room. By the way, um, I I made a lot of videos. Who are you? <laughs> I'm Label Cohen. I'm I'm Tanya's husband. Ah uh, yes, yes. She told me about you. She said you're, yeah. you write songs. I made all the Agent Emma's videos, so I, I I have experience making entertainment for the Jewish world, and now I've started to write songs and record my own songs. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just stick to one. Do you think it's possible to write Jewish music that can cross over into the secular the world? Or are our worlds so completely different that the subject matter we go into is inaccessible to the wider world? My opinion, I don't see the, the, the purpose of it. Of, of what, what do I need? What, what do I need to, I don't need, I don't, I don't personally feel the need to cross over at all. And, and I can tell you that my music, I did, as I said, in the beginning, I did. In the beginning, I did. In the beginning, all I wanted to do was, was cross over. I thought, I'm talking about years. And when I, when I decided that, when I understood the shlichas, I understood what, what, what I'm doing and why, uh, you know, there's so few people that are doing this for cholesterol. What do I need? What do I need them? You know, they're wonderful. They do other great things, but uh, I'm not interested in their. You know, you look at a, you look at a guy like Avramel. Avramel lit up a world. They lit up a world. It, it, it's 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 the amount of Eden that he made happy. The amount of I'm talking about Eden that needed the happiness. They needed the cheering up. They needed. Uh, oh, you know, I get an opportunity to go with with some groups to a hospital sometimes and. Uh, no yid should be in the hospital, everybody should be healthy and so on. But you walk into a room and there's a person who's not well and they see you and they smile because you came to their room. You, that is the greatest reward. There's no, so big deal. So the, so the, so the guy have a hit song, who cares? You know, I wouldn't trade my Tanya for the entire, I can tell the entire, the, the sound of music, which is a great. I, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't maybe, trade maybe for Yentl, okay, but not for the sound of music. I was. I wouldn't trade my song. I'm going to a wedding. I'm going to a wedding on on Bella Bracha. I, I have to hear this song. <laughs> anyway. um, it, it's a children's song. It's my most popular hit. It has three oh. lines. Go figure. Um, okay. But yes. Well, I, I, I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you. I have others, but I'll let other people ask questions. If Thank you buy my masterclass, we'll let you ask more questions next time. <laughs> oh, super! Great. Thank you. Um. Um. Hi. Um. Hi. Bracha will ask a question, and then Bracha Jaffe. Bracha Jaffe is a friend and peer and. She's a very successful female singer. She also breaks a lot of glass ceilings. I'm familiar. Even I heard of her. Yeah, nice. So, 
Hi, Bracha, go ahead. Hi, Bracha, you know, um, Hi, Bracha could speak for herself. Go ahead. Thank you, Hanala. I'm the person you never heard of. <laughs> My yes. name is Chaim Bracha yes. Rubin. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the vote of confidence. I'm a singer-songwriter. My name is Chaim Bracha Rubin. I live in Albany, New York with my family. And I am a Balash Tshuva. So I've been writing songs, you know, before I even realized I was Jewish. I'm not going to give you my life story. <laughs> Don't worry. But um, I've been singing and performing for years with very limited um, resources and people have just heard about me I, and I get messages asking to perform places and I have backing tracks that I've Baruch Hashem paid you know for to be professionally produced I'm a composer I'm a, I'm a songwriter and everyone keeps asking me when are you putting out a CD when are you making your music and it's such a hard question to answer because I could do it at the base level I could get right on my mic and I could make a little music video right here and play my backing track and it would just sound, you know, for anyone who really knows music, it would sound okay. That was kind of nice. My husband's trying to convince me that I should just go for it and put it out there because the message, I mean, even with my iPhone recorded this, that, and the other thing, people could cry, people cry from my lyrics and my stories and things. And, and yet I say, you know, but we have to somehow invest. And where do I start? Because to me, if I'm going to take the time to do it, I want to do it right. I want it to sound good enough that someone who doesn't care, who is doesn't know me or never heard of me could say, I'm going to listen for more than 30 seconds because what I'm what I'm writing about is based on Hasidus and it's based and it's and it's from overcome, you know, it's to overcome struggle and to mechazek people and to exactly do what you're talking about. So my question is, what's your advice? Do I go for it and just say, this is the best I can do right now with the resources that I have? Or do I say, let me at least take one song, my best song that I feel is like, represents my heart and soul and say, let's just, let's spend it. Yeah, go like spend a thousand dollars, which for me, that's a lot of money. I mean, I work as a machanchas. I'm, I'm a teacher. That's my job. That's my, I have Baruch Hashem, three little kids. I'm curious to hear. But yeah. So, first of all, I, I'm I'm touched by what you're saying, and I, I um, you know, it, it kind of boils down to the, you know, Oz Yashir Moshe, and uh, then, then Miriam sang, and she had to go out of town, and uh, but she took along musical instruments. You can see that the, the girls were musical before the boys were. But anyway, I definitely would go for that one song, definitely. You know, every once in a while, I did two uh, composers workshops where, uh, like like Hanlon says, we we try to give back to to some of the people that are that are that are trying. And because we we were we were very lucky in the beginning because when I started, everybody was patient. Uh, you know, you ever heard of Yisrael Lamb? Anybody Yisrael yes. Lamb? Yeah. <laughs> he was, okay, he was the one that brought he brought the concept of song arrangements and orchestrations into the into 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 the Jewish music world. By the way, every one of those guys has a role, which I can, if I ever get a chance to write it, I, I'm, I'm just hoping that there's still going to be anybody that's interested to 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 show exactly, who, in my eyes, what Israel contributed to Klal Israel and what A. B. Rottenberg contributed and what what, what about Rick Cutler? Did. What about what? Rick, Rick Cutler? <laughs> Rick Cutler, okay. Rick. Wow. Okay, Gal Gershavsky. Well, Rick Cutler is the piano teacher of a lot of the guys who are playing piano today. So I'm not, I don't know if you're aware of that. But anyway, yeah. so I said that um, I would take that one song. And uh, yes, I, I started telling you. So when when they come to me, they want to play. I want to I want to I have so many. So I said, no, no, no. Don't, don't give me 20 songs. You know, in your heart, you know, the song, you know, the one. You don't want it, you don't want it to be nobody wants it to be only that one song. Please come on, I wrote 20 songs. But if you're gonna be honest with yourself, you know that there is that one song that you are a thousand percent sure. And that's the one that you invest the money in. And by the way, you don't need to invest that much. You need you just need somebody who understands and who who um, who has uh, who has the setup that they can really uh, I'm working now with with uh, I don't know, Hanala, do you do this stuff? Do you do you, you arrange and so on? I've, I've done many piano tracks for, 
Where I okay, so I'm working now. I'm, I'm, I worked with all of them, by the way. The one that I'm really having a blast with now is is uh, Ellie Klein and and uh, Yitzi Berry. The two of them are like they're like kind of complement each other, and then they're not expensive, and they 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 send you back. The most important thing is that you get back a demo track. Hey, that's the critical. That's the critical thing. So you get the demo track, and you know whether the person has delivered your message or not before you do before you spend any more money on it. And once you have that demo track, then uh, you go for it. It's, 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 you don't need an album today anymore. You need a great song. And once you have the great song, you go to people that will help you, uh, you know, do a video. There's people over here that I'm watching on the screen here. There's so many people who can do that for you, but that's, uh, you should definitely do it. It's, 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 uh, you, have, you probably have a perspective, which is very critical, very important, you know? I believe that's why that's why we're so lucky with the Baltruva movement in our life, because we get that perspective that, you know, looking, what did one of the rebels said? Don't look out of the window, look in. You know, I also married a Baltruva, by the way, and uh, th that perspective saved me, totally saved me. Amazing. So Amazing. There's a, it's a wonderful perspective to share, and do it be much later beautiful thank you so much and You're i welcome. just ha i just have to say that it is such an honor thank you so much for doing thank this you. hanala because you know you can meet talented people but when you meet someone who is talented and they're your shamayim and they have their head on straight and they give over it's just thank you thank you thank so you much. i appreciate okay. that okay we have we're gonna ask we're, we're, the, this part this, this zoom will last another six minutes so we're gonna give um, bracha a minute, we're going to give, not because they don't deserve more than a minute, because it's just getting late and it's morning here. We'll give bracha a minute, we'll give Dabi a minute, and we'll give um, Shandy a minute just to, to ask a question, and then um, we'll wrap up the night. So, bracha Jaffe, go ahead. You don't need okay, an introduction. So, thank you, Hannah. Um, first of all, just one quick thing. Hi, bracha. You should definitely put your music out there. I just want to say that, okay? Just as, a, as an encouraging girl to girl, you got to do it. That's it will, there, by the way. Go on. What? I'm saying that's coming from a successful person. Really I so, um, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. So I have a question, you know, um, Rabbi Green, I'm going to say it that way as respect to someone who I admire. Um, I, you know, I spoke to like, I think it was about 10 years ago, we had a brief conversation about new compositions and, um, I remember briefly asking you about, you know, writing for a uh, writing for a female singer, yeah. and um, and it was it was it was it was a it was a quickly overturned overturned question, which I understand because it's it's a hard question to answer. It's also like a sensitive topic, but you know, in today's world, we see that women yeah. write um, for men. We see. Kyle Newhouse writes for Benny Friedman and many other singers, and we see Miriam Israeli, who composes beautiful lyrics and songs for um, for for male singers. And now there's there's a there's a very there's something very special happening in the female Jewish world, Jewish music world, and there's a need for and a very very big niche that's developing for for women as singers and. Um, and it's 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 eloping, even though it's been it's been in existence for quite some time, but now it's really really getting into something that's hard to describe in words. Um, and I, I I wonder, would someone like you, who's who's such an incredible composer, ever write for a female singer? With the greatest of joy, of course. I wrote for I wrote for Ruti Navon, I think thirty years ago. It was one of the real great singers. She, she, she I've never she, heard of Ruti Navon. I know that Ruti Navon. I know Ruti Navon very well. Okay, I, so, so I, wrote, uh, I wrote three songs for her at, at that time. The definite, absolutely. Because you, because you said you, you elaborated so much on how in the beginning of the conversation in Hanala and how music is there's still so much to achieve. Sure. And I think one of the aspects in music that there's so much to achieve in is inspiring young girls that there's a place for music because, and there's a place for them in the music world. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry that if I gave, uh, I don't remember. No, it wasn't, an, it actually wasn't a negative conversation. You actually encouraged me to go big. And I did. 
a, a thousand percent. And that's you when know, I started. I, I have my daughters, you know, my daughters, and they, they well, Mary. you know, Mary, you know, Ricky, you know, and they, they always wanted, you know, they always, they, they said, why can't we? You said, yes, you can. I don't know how. Figure it out. Work it out. I, 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 I was always explaining that I cannot go into the, into the female world and make it happen, but you, you, got, you can. You guys can. So if it's a matter of writing songs, I'm ready, willing, and able. There's a lot of respect. Oh, I, the, I would love the challenge. I would love the challenge. There's Very a lot much. of respect for the women in this industry. I'm I'm working with Yuval Supa for the first time, and he's you know, and True. he 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 greeted me like eagerly to work with me, and I was very pleasantly surprised. With, with pleasure. Um. Okay, we're gonna ask two more questions. Um. Dobby wanted to ask a question. Dobby is um. Dobby's Dobby. There's only one Dobby. I'm sure. She, I'm sure she's gonna. I'm looking her. Gershie Schwartz is my brother. You work oh. with. Which who? Gershie Schwartz. Okay. My brother. All right. He is, by the way, one of the few great, great vocal producers today. I agree. Yeah. You live. You live. You live in, over here, or you live I in? Live, I live in New York. We moved the York. same the same week. Oh. My brother and I. Okay. He's so Z's. He's got a killer accent, by the way. <laughs> He's supposed to be here tonight. I don't know what happened to him. So that Thursday night is musicians' night. A lot of musicians, Baruch Hashem, are working. Very busy. Yes. Baruch Hashem. Yes. Um, first of all, I'm uh, I'm going to be very quick because I know it's late. Um, but first of all, I'm a big fan of all your songs, my husband including. Um, I have a small question about compositions. My husband composes songs as well, um, and I'm curious when you compose all your songs, do you compose them all with an instrument or just by composing like it comes out of? No, so what I, what I use, and, and I'm, I'm hampered by that, is I use, I use the piano to write music. So it's very interesting. You can, uh, you, if you would like, people ask me, what's the difference between, between Shlomo Kalbach, the Kremlin of Rocha, or Ahavon Ben-Chan, Chaim Baruch Sheit, or they are guitar writers. When you write music with a guitar, you have to use your voice more so the song is automatically more singable. When you're on the piano, you can make believe that the song is singable because the piano's got 88 notes and so on. And many times you come out with something which is completely unusable. So, but, but, I will, but I use the piano as a background, but I'm actually screaming at the top of my lung. I'm so right. have, you, have any of this song been composed without an instrument at all? Yeah, I have a song where it say, it say, Hashem, Eloi, he got a song, but anyway, so that song was written by the Kotel one Friday night. I happened to be the Kotel. I was in the old, old city of Shabbos, and I went back. I wanted to see what the Kotel looked like at that, that time of night, and it was, strangely enough, there was nobody there, and I remember I had this moment, I had this feeling it was one o'clock at night, which means that America just went to Daven, and all the prayers are coming through the Kotel, and they're going, and all of a sudden, I got the, I got the creeps. I'm at the, all of Kuala Israel is davening, and all the tillers are coming here, and I'm here. You know, and I literally got, and I started singing, Ritzei Hashem, like, like, hey, you know, accept Kuala Israel's prayers. I had no other way to channel it. And uh, so that was the one song that happened. And that was the fact that I even remembered it is, is a miracle, you know, because simple songs are very hard to remember. Simple songs are the greatest, simple melodies, but they're very difficult to remember. Right, so my, my husband composed the whole album, but he has no clue how to play an instrument. That's why I'm saying. Uh, no, no, you can always play yeah. well, you play for him, Dobby. I play it on the piano for him afterwards. But... Uh, wow, that's great. That sounds like a nice couple, by the way. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to wrap up this evening with a question from Shandy, which actually ties very nicely into our theme because you are a link um, to the past and Shandy is a link to the future. Shandy is um, a young, youngish, um, successful female entertainer. She's also involved in a lot of beautiful chesed committee, um, committees. If there's a, something good going on, Shandy's involved in it, and she also is a great singer and performer. So, Shandy, by all means, ask us your question. I Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so firstly, I'll keep it short. I firstly wanted to say I'm so appreciative of all the work that you've done and all the incredible music that you've brought into the world. I, I'm young, but I have a very old soul and I have a very strong appreciation for all types of music. So thank you. Um, my question is very general. I really don't have a specific question. 
it's too hard to come up with something specific, but I just wanted to ask um, what, if you could give one piece of advice to everyone out there in the music world, what would it be? It would be find the text, find this incredible text that you understand in a very unique, special way and, and get it to music and get it out there because that's really where your success lies. It lies in that message, you know, that, that message that you, you took a message which was, it just had lyrics until you came along and now it has wings, it has, it has music. That's, and it's yours, you know, that, that's really the message because that's where it begins and that's, from, that's where it takes off from. I, I, I hear that, that's great, thank you. I, always... you know, see, I do have one question that I have to ask. What is your Mount Rushmore of, uh, of Jewish songs? Four best songs that you think that are out there that are just like epic Jewish songs that are considered Jewish songs that you would consider as the greatest Jewish songs. Okay, so besides some are from the Balatanya? Yeah, oh, a good one. That is Definitely, one. some are from the Balatanya is one of- I sing it all the wow. time. That, well, that that's definitely one. Yeah. There is another one. Actually, I I I, I did an interview with Mishpacha magazine in Israel today on the on the phone, and, and Pesach they're putting out, and they asked me the same question, and I told them there is a, uh, a yid whose name is Reberish Vishover who went passed away in the Holocaust. He was the composer of the Hungarian Romanian world before the war. His name is Reberish Horowitz, and he wrote a song for Satmar the old Satmar for the Nanum, you know, Satan Rebbe said, I want for when I do this, the, you know? So he wrote a seven part song, which I believe is the magnum opus of, of where I come from, so to speak. So, right. that, that, so that's from there. From today, I mean, uh, look, uh, AB's um, Come With Me Little Neshomel. I mean, if that, if that didn't, if that didn't just, I mean, show me, tell me a Geisha song in the history that, that delivered that message and showed exactly what was able to take a lyric and, and a song and ah, unbelievable. What about the song, what about Yehey Yehey? Revolt. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yehey yeah, 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 hey, hey was definitely, uh, um, it, it broke new ground. Yes. It was a little easy to me at the time. I was a little bit uh, against it at the time because I was very wary of Kaddish. Kaddish to me was a little holier. I wouldn't uh, touch Kaddish, but you're, your generation can, so. Yeah, yeah. You want I to think your Rosh song also has to be up there as one of the most, you know, incredible songs that were Which ever song? with music. Kol Belama, Kol Belama. Oh, that one, the first one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, in my opinion, I mean, there's a, there's a cover that was done by um, that young boy, the singer, I forgot his name, an Israeli kid, together with... Um, Oh man, I, know I, I don't. About. Yeah. Yeah, there've been a lot of covers on. I know, I know who you. I know who you're talking about. Uh, I, I actually agree with that song, the London Boys Choir. <laughs> that yeah. one. Yeah, no, but he's talking about somebody else. He's talking about those. Not the, that Cole Berman. I mean, the he did, he, I did he, a cover he played, that song. Played the piano and he sang. I forgot the boy's name. I'll look it up. I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Amir yeah. Dvir was the piano player for that. They, they they did like a whole CD with just piano, yeah. and. They chose that as the first song, at the, you know, at the, en the entrance to, to the CD, and it was just like, it's epic. epic. That, was my entrance to, that was my entrance to the music world. Well, Yossi... Uh, and, when, and when Yigal Salik told me that, it's a, that he thinks it's a gorgeous song, I thought he was making fun of me. Until uh, we actually, I actually saw the London boys go out on stage and start singing. I, till that moment, I didn't believe, I thought that he was pulling my leg. So... Wow gift, a real gift from God. I did not play piano at that time. I had one finger. I don't know if you know the story, but I was in London at the time and I was in an attic. I lived in an attic and the attic had a lot of um, a lot of boxes and stuff. And I was very miserable there because and any of you have been to London in the winter, you know what miserable is. And I come up from Yeshiva at night, eight o'clock, had nothing to do. I went upstairs to my, my room. And one day I just began to clear boxes off the corner and there was an old grand piano that was broken with all kinds of keys mm -hmm. that raised and lowered and so on. And I had one finger and I began to bang out that pattern. And then when Yigal became my friend and uh, he asked me, did you ever write a song? And I said, as a joke, 
I, I did that. And he jumped off, jumped off the couch and he ran to the Svarim Shang, took out a Chumish Vayichi and took out the Rashi and, and Koyamar Hashem over there. And I, I, I was dumbfounded. I, I hadn't even, I came from a home. We didn't know that performance music, I'd never even heard of perform, the concept of performance music. You know, today we know it exists. London Birche was on stage. I, we never saw a stage, uh, anybody on stage. And he says, Yassi, you'll see, we're going to put it on all the stages of the world. And I said, Diego, I don't care. I'm just, I, 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 you, you stop making fun of me, you know? And then I remember it was on stage and I was transformed. So amazing. amazing. Yeah. I, I, will I, didn't have a I didn't have master class before. Imagine mm -hmm. that song would sound like then. <laughs> You're the only person I'm, I'm not going to hawk my masterclass to. Everyone else could buy it. Right, You're the right. only person. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I may take that masterclass. Um, I may take it just, yeah. just for the purpose, just for learning, learning how to do a masterclass, you know. It's, okay. uh, you, seem to, you, you seem to have mastered it. Thank you all for supporting um, my cause. Um, thank you, Yossi, for sharing your thoughts Pleasure. with us. And I want to bless you that you should continue to succeed in your musical endeavors, whatever they might, mm -hmm. whatever they might mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. And that um, we can continue this conversation about music with pride and enthusiasm and joy in health and without masks Amen. on in person, hopefully. Lamar to all of you. Good Good everyone. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.